guys. Laser pointer. Thank you for still being here. We know it's towards the end, but this I is a, like our capstone yeah, event. And, can, the um, okay, cool. and we really want to encourage everyone to think along and discuss along. Um, this is an important thing for the CSDMS community um, to be diverse, to be inclusive, to be um, promoting equity. Um, and we have um, had three people kindly agree to help us with thinking about uh, programs that you can tap into to promote diversity, like what kind of strategies, um, what are issues in our community still, or in the community of earth science as a larger community, I guess. I don't think we know it all exactly for the CSDMS community. Um, in, in general, um, we feel we've been thinking about this, but there may still be lots of things to do better, et cetera. And so like one of the goals of today is to, to hear your voices and hear from people who do this on a more uh, programmatic basis or um, in a more um, project and um, structured way than CSDMS has been doing it. So we have here Leho Flores from Boise State University and he'll be moderating and has some slides to sort of speed up, like get everyone some information and um, sort of talk about what the goals are today. Um, we have Anne Gold, who's here at CU. She runs, a, she runs actually many programs for like outreach and, uh, and undergraduate education, etc. But the particular program that we asked her to sort of bring to the table is this uh, um, program called REX that um, is for community college students and engaging them into uh, science that goes on at the university. We have Kadidia, um, who's at UCAR and um, promotes diversity there, and, and we'll speak a bit about that. And then Venkat uh, and Aisha. Um, Venkat's back to being a professor, but Aisha is at NSF right now, um, and she's remote on a Zoom. Um, and so they will have a little bit more of the, the NSF perspective on this and like what kind of programs are there at NSF that we can tap into and what are the sort of the philosophies that are going on there. Yes. I'm mic'd up, so yeah, okay. Um, I can, do you guys have enough microphones there? Or should I just turn this one off? Um, I'll turn this one off for now. Just um, So uh, thanks to Greg and to Arena for the opportunity to moderate this and I, I think obviously this is something that a lot of us are, are increasingly sort of concerned about, but I think um, the other sort of, um, you know, the other thing that I've sort of detected in our co relative communities is a real desire to make a difference and, and get better about diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? And so, but um, us being trained as sort of geoscientists and as modelers, we, we don't necessarily sort of have the tools, the capabilities, um, or know what the sort of programmatic pathways are to, to being better about this. And so, you know, my hope is that this being the last sort of session um, that, that we will formally be here in plenary at Systems will, you know, we'll go away from here with an idea of maybe some things that we can do between now and when we see each other again next year um, to, you know, to advance the state of diversity, um, equity, and inclusion in in the geosciences and in the modeling community in particular. So um, this is gonna be a real quick uh, PowerPoint presentation, but many of us know, you know, so getting to this characterization of the state of where we're at, um, you know, we, we as a community, um, as geoscientists and earth sciences, so these are um, PhDs awarded by gender, um, female in blue, male in red. Um, and we, as we see in the past 45-ish uh, years, um, the gender balance of PhDs awarded in the earth sciences is improving. We're, we're pretty much at parity at this point um, in this, this last sort of data point in this survey. But at the same time, when it comes to um, ethnic and racial diversity, uh, how many of you actually saw this paper that was in Nature? Um, great, that's awesome. So um, I found this and I immediately forwarded it to our entire department um, because this is something that we all need to be um, very aware of. So, you know, despite trying to make progress on diversity in the past 40 years, um, the data shows, right, and we are sort of fundamentally often data-driven 
people, the data shows that we have not made any progress. And this headline, you know, should really sort of shake us to our core um, when it comes to diversity and equity and inclusion. And if you dig deeper in, and um, thanks to Irina in particular for sort of doing this deep dive. So if we look at what the facts are, um, so it's tough to see, but if you, I draw your attention to these sort of final panels, um, this is the racial break, break, breakdown of um, awarded uh, doctoral uh, theses um, between 1973 and 2016. This is a, a table from that Bernard and uh, Cooperdonk paper. Um, and if you look at this, if you look at um, the bottom line here is that um, these are all science and engineering PhDs awarded. Um, and uh, these, this, is, this column here is the, um, this, the, the background population of these different racial and ethnic groups. Um, and if you look at it, you know, in science and engineering in particular, um, you know, we are by a factor of three about um, underperforming in terms of, you know, um, uh, a, doctorate, a doctorate that sort of looks broadly representative of, of our society. And in the geosciences, it's, it's even worse, right? And so, um, so the state of where we're at is, is, is not great in terms of what the numbers are, but it's important to sort of know where we're starting and to, to, to confront um, the reality as, as, as it is. And so the question is, is, you know, how do we do better? And the, the question for our panelists and for all of you is how do we do better as a community? What actions can we both take as individuals as well as a community to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, systems in its renewal proposal has gotten very aggressive about this, which is great. Um, you heard Greg's um, uh, introduction at the, at the beginning of the meeting talking about this being a, a diverse, open, and welcoming community. Um, and um, Systems is doing a number of things um, specifically to, uh, to address uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and so, um, you know, our, our annual meeting in particular, um, so uh, if, if you look at sort of the distribution, women make up about 29% of C systems executive committee, um, and the steering committees committee features 40% women, so we're almost at parity there in terms of leadership, which um, a lot of studies have pointed out is particularly challenging because of um, the, the gender disparity in, in sort of senior levels of, of, of uh, science and engineering scholars. Um, uh, in, this is directly from the proposal. So they've made it uh, committed to developing an open transparent process for populating science teams, which takes into account diversity in career stage, gender expertise, institutional origin. So that includes R1s, four-year colleges, HBCUs, um, and other criteria. I think one of the things that has been brought up uh, in um, in the community is that often in, in training people from diverse backgrounds into leadership roles, it, it requires sort of a one-on-one -on -one approach, right? So it requires somebody from a leadership position actually making um, a directed email, a directed phone call to somebody from an underrepresented group to say, hey, we really think that you would be awesome in this leadership role and we really appreciate your perspective and we would invite you to serve in this capacity or to um, to stand for election to this, this board. Um, at the earliest level, so addressing sort of the very, you know, the, the earliest level that an organization like Systems can, um, uh, CSDMOS offers student stipends for attendance at the annual meeting. Each year Systems offers about five of these um, with an aim to improve uh, diversity. So these, these scholarships are advertised nationally through the Institute of Broadening, Broadening Participation, um, the Association of Women Geoscientists and, and other organizations, but obviously, you know, there's, there's perhaps some opportunities there to sort of be um, uh, a little bit more broad in terms of, of how we reach out. So, um, so, you know, I think that one of the things that we wanted to cover with our panelists is, you know, uh, what are some existing things that you all as, as scientists, as, as investigators, as postdocs and graduate students, you know, oftentimes I think, you know, we being sort of tinkerers and doers try the DIY approach of, of doing it ourselves. And often, um, you know, while that's a, that's a great sort of uh, instinct, there's, there's so many resources and opportunities to, to engage with um, and so many things that can serve as sort of force multipliers of what we're doing. And so one reason that we brought these group of panelists on board was to, ask and, and 
ask them to sort of tell us about some of the programming that their respective institutions offer and to brainstorm, brainstorm some ideas with you know, folks like Venka and Aisha about you know, how you might wrap these into your next proposal or supplement requests um, and, and to, to be effective about sort of enhancing diversity in, um, in the geosciences. And so with that, um, I think what we wanted to do real quick is just provide maybe a real quick short opportunity for each of our panelists to discuss in particular um, research, uh, recess recs, um, SOARs, and REU opportunities. Um, and so I'll start off with Anne in particular and sort of ask her to talk about uh, uh, recs. Okay, thank you. Does that work? Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm delighted to speak here and it's a great panel to be here and talking with you. And I just wanted to, um, I'm representing the RECS program. And if you look here, you might wonder why this doesn't look very diverse if you look at the RECS students right here. And so what the program that we do, and I guess you're all familiar, the, the arc of all these programs are uh, summer research experiences that bring in students into an intensive mentor-mentee relationship over and they work on individual project in authentic research. So our programs have slightly different length and have slightly different other components, but we all provide training, we all provide some support for the students, we select them and then we select uh, mentors and um, they, at the end of the summer, do a poster presentation and a talk, uh, just like an AGU style presentation, so they really get through the entire scientific process as a summary for all these programs. And so what is, um, just to maybe draw the differences, uh, the Rex program addresses community college students. And uh, thinking about diversity, diversity is very different and it, there's a lot of um, different components. Of course, there's, racial, there's gender diversity, which we've heard, there's racial and ethnic diversity, but especially in a state uh, like Colorado that has a very um, white population, there's also a lot of socioeconomic diversity. Uh, and there's rural, like uh, opportunities in rural states, uh, rural parts of the state are terrible. There's like, they have like one outlet in a classroom. They have only four days of school each week because they don't, can't afford school five days. So it, there's huge gradients within states like Colorado. And we are drawing from these uh, community college students that go, um, can't afford a four year college, but they go to these um, less expensive colleges. And we draw from these, they, we call them research limited institutions. So they don't have exposure. If somebody comes to CU and is an undergraduate, they get exposure to research right and left, but they don't at a community college, especially if they might have family, if they may be veterans, if they have first generation college students and don't have an inspiration from their family. So that's what Rex does, and uh, we draw local here. Um, one of the advantages is too that then sometimes the students continue working in the lab. I know that one of the students that Greg had last year, she comes back and she comes to see you now and she works in your lab, for example. So that's an opportunity that a program like that offers. There's a lot of other um, models that have other advantages, and I'm just pointing out the differences. Yeah, so uh, let's then go, to, so that's great. Um, let's go to uh, Khadija to talk about um, SOARS um, from the UCAR perspective. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, should I also talk about UCAR first though? That would be great, yeah. Okay, absolutely. so UCAR, everyone knows what that is, right? Uh, <laughs> their diversity efforts, they have an Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and it's focused on helping our organization reaches goals of creating an inclusive workplace that values all individuals and their perspectives, contributions, and ideas in pursuit of the organization's mission. It is um, primarily funded by the NSF. So in 2017, this office was created. So it's only been two and a half years that they even created this office and they did a cultural survey, institutional cultural survey to evaluate areas that they wanted to focus on. And some of those specific areas were clearly communicating the code of conduct, reporting procedures, better supervisor tra training, and changing the hiring procedures to recruit more diverse applicants, pool and create more inclusive processes. So many of these um, initiatives were written into their strategic plan, which is actually online. And a part of their strategic plan is to support inclusive science practices through a uh, organization called Rising Voices, which builds 
bridges and collaborations between indigenous and Western ways of knowledge. And this uh, conference just actually happened last week. Um, so that's the Office of Diversity, uh, Equity and Inclusion. The Chief Diversity Officer is not able to be here today, but we do have Kristen Luna Aponte. And if you go to their website, you can see who all of the people are. So the SOARS program, which is significant opportunities in atmospheric research and science is a part of UCAR. Um, it began in 1996 and it exists to increase the diversity contributing and impacting the atmospheric sciences community. This program is actually a model for many other REUs. This program is different in that um, the students, we call them protégés, are multi-year. They can come every summer for up to four summers. We offer ongoing support, mentoring. Um, protégés receive up to five mentors per summer. Um, that's a writing mentor, a research mentor, a computational coach in case they need um, MATLAB, Python additional um, support, as well as a community coach and um, a peer mentor from the returning protégés. This program just started on Sunday, and so we um, have a cohort of 20 this summer, and some of them haven't even arrived yet. But um, on Friday, so they work in labs and um, throughout NCAR, as well as NOAA and CU Boulder. So this program has opportunity for people to write in a SOAR student with their budget. We have a template. Um, for instance, the Climate Program Office at NOAA has four slots for students. Um, you know, CU Boulder has uh, proposals out that have written SOARs into their grant. So that's another way to get students so they, they get the 11 weeks of, of research. But also on Fridays, they do have professional development, computational workshops, as well as scientific writing. And like Anne said, at the end, they have deliverables, which include a paper, uh, uh, an abstract to present at a conference, and um, poster presentation. So these are the things that they are doing in order to penetrate the, um, the community. So this need is an opportunity to benefit from the nation's intellectual capital. Conversations about race, gender, physical challenges, and minoritized communities demonstrate to the world that there is no monopoly on intellectual capacity. And there, there are national conversations happening right now that intellectual capacity is a natural resource and this lack of diversity prevents all of us from benefiting. So SOARS is trying to um, contribute to the conversation. Untapped are the marginalized and minoritized communities that are missing from the conversation and the nation is losing out. And, uh, we are in our 23rd year. Awesome, thank you. And um, what I'll do now is actually pivot real quick to uh, Aisha because um, Prior to being at the National Science Foundation, she was actually at UNAVCO um, and um, uh, uh, can provide a little bit of background on recess. Um, and then after doing that, Aisha, and then um, the question to maybe both you and Venkat um, is from the perspective of, of the National Science Foundation, um, what are some ways that you might think about encouraging PIs, graduate students, postdocs to be plugging into these existing um, these existing programs, um, you know, both, you know, sort of national and level, but maybe perhaps at their own institutions, and how might that sort of serve to make their proposals uh, stronger? Okay, well, I, I'll say very a minimal amount about recess as uh, I'm no longer with the program. Um, but recess is actually uh, sort of a daughter of SOARS. It's the solid earth version of the SOARS program, so therefore it has very similar um, programming components, um, multiple mentors, multiple years, students, uh, they do independent research. They're primarily from groups that are underrepresented in the field. And at the end of the summer, they present their research uh, in talks and in poster form, and they have the opportunity to attend a professional meeting um, in the fall or spring following their summer um, 
depending on, on what their interest is and what their research area of focus is. And if you have more questions about recess, I um, just want to point people to Andy Ellis. She's the recess program director at UNAVCO. So she'd be able to answer any questions you have about that program. Great, thank you. Then, did you want me to, to go or did you want uh, Benkia to go? Um, if you can go ahead and, and answer the sort of the second part of that question, then I'll bring okay. it back to Venkat. Okay, so ways to plug in. Um, well, the REU program is a, a great uh, opportunity for people to write into their proposals as they're developing a proposal and thinking about how to, to have a strong, broader impact uh, portion of your proposal. Because as you remember, proposals are reviewed through the merit review criteria, intellectual merit, and broader impacts. And these uh, folks on the stage, Anna and Kadidia, have great programs that you could actually just write in a student, communicate with them, and then write in a student um, based on the support information that's in their programs into the proposal. So, I mean, I think that would make, it, it makes it a strong proposal because you're plugging into something that exists that's been proven to have an impact uh, on the community. And uh, it also takes some of the burden off the PI in terms of spinning up and supporting a student. So I'm not going to, uh, I've spent about 21 years in academia, uh, 19 and a half years at the University of South Carolina, of which one and a half years as a rotator at NSF. So obviously I'll have to put my co uh, comments in the same proportion as the time spent. Uh, so, uh, I'll, the only thing about NSF I'll say is uh, very important is that uh, rotator, and that's the last one over there. Uh, I would encourage everybody at least once in their lifetime to do it, and you can do it for as short as one year or as long as three years. And I can tell you without a doubt, I enjoyed my time there. And uh, reading, evaluating proposals is only 30% of the job. I mean, you, you, that's the main job, but you meet with other exciting people, both in your division in your directorate and across other directorates. I mean, I've met people uh, 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 in many other directorates. Uh, of course, I cannot communicate with any of them for a year, so. <laughs> but I, I really think it's a great thing to do. And NSF also offers assistance in housing as well as money to travel, to do your research work one day a week. So it's all, it's a very, very good program. And this is the thing which they're looking for people. And I think every, uh, faculty member in this audience or every research scientist in this audience or in this room is qualified to do that job. That's it. And so with respect to diversity, I just have a few observations. So uh, in the 19 and a half years I spent at USC, it's a state school in South Carolina. So you can think that it's a little bit of a, uh, you know, uh, an average sampling throughout the country. And there is good gender diversity in environmental science and in marine science. And when it comes to geology, there is still not that equity. And when it comes to racial and ethnic diversity, forget it. I mean, there is not much. And that's where we have to try. And at, while at NSF, in my limited time there, I had discussions with people. And I don't know if you can really uh, include that kind of diversity when students have graduated from high school and chosen their majors. I mean, the real thing is to go to the source and you know, you're talking about middle school or even elementary school, if you can get even one kid excited in one school district in the country, in each school district in the country to become an earth scientist, you know, who is gender and racial and ethnic diversity, trust me, you'll triple or, you know, you'll probably achieve equity in, a, you know, in the same, you know, in the same time period. So I, I really think that the problem arises from, uh, from young age because earth sciences is not not in high school as a scientist. Most high school, some high school probably have it. So that's where you have a problem with diversity. Thank you, Venkat. That's a great pivot to sort of our next point. But one thing I wanted to do real quick um, before we move on is um, how many of you are aware of sort of existing programming at your home institutions? Um, things like the LS AMPS, the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation, um, McNair, which addresses first generation families. How many of you are aware of those and okay now raise your hand if you have sort of recruited students through those 
program. So th those are great environments because I think that they, they're localized, right? They, they help you with recruiting and, you know, the vast majority of them do provide additional sort of support for professional development, um, community development, mentoring that I think is really valuable. And so um, if, if you're not aware of those programs, then I would strongly encourage you to sort of um, reach out to them and look for them at your home institution as soon as you, you go back home. Um, Venkat brings up a sort of very good point, right, which is um, I think a lot of us have this struggle of, you know, how do we, we know that we have a sort of a challenge when it comes to um, diversity in the, in, in, in the earth sciences and the geosciences. I guess one, one question to both the panel and to the audience are, you know, what, you know, we, we recognize those challenges, but are there things that we as as modelers, right, as computational thinkers, um, as um, data scientists, um, are, are there things that we're doing where we can actually exhibit leadership with respect to the recruiting um, diverse um, and equitable um, populations? And so I'd, I'd put that to, to the panel and to the audience, you know, what are the, what are the kinds of things that we should be playing up about who we are as a systems community and as who we are as sort of more computationally minded folks um, and and what might we what might that look like and and how we we might leverage our strengths that we have here to, to be leaders when it comes to diversity equity inclusion in, in the earth sciences one of the things that we've seen in the Rex program is um, that the students and our diversity, as I said earlier, is not so visible as other diversity. It's not, you can't say, oh, this is a um, student of color, but these students that come in from community colleges or from any other diversity, they come often in with an imposter syndrome. They feel like they don't belong there. And it's often, they always ask us, why did you select me? Like why out of anyone that applied, it, would you think I'm, qualified. And often they actually come in with less preparation than maybe some undergraduates that are have taken your classes already come in. So what we've seen is really important is really strong mentorship and really helping the students and being aware that they may not feel included. So if you want, especially computational skills, you can really overwhelm students, but they can do it. And if you help them and maybe pair them up with a grad student or something, if you get uh, people excited and men provide uh, mentorship that's thoughtful and not just science-based, but also checking in saying, how are you doing? You know, we really value you here. I think these are t small things, but they go a really long way. There's one other one. You guys have one right now. Um, so this is Katie Barnhart. Hi, Aisha. Um, I, my question has to do with uh, the sort of dimensions of mentorship and where the dimensions of mentorship need to expand. So in the SOARS program, you listed like 10 different types of mentors. And I can, five, five. <laughs> I was impressed by the number. And as someone who's mentored students in the um, Rex program, I can definitely relate to how all of those dimensions are really important because as a scientist, I, I have my expertise in how I mentor a student and, and I often feel like I, am, I get out of my element in the ways in which the students need mentorship. And so uh, I think, uh, the, my specific question is, as um, coordinators of these fantastic programs, what are, a, are there additional sort of aspects of uh, sort of types of mentorship that you feel like the students would benefit from but are not getting? Um, and then what do you see your role as helping um, mentors meet the students where they need to be met? Well, I just started in February, but <laughs> <laughs> I did come from a program, the NOAA Center for Atmospheric Sciences and Meteorology at Howard University, and we had internships, and we had a weather camp.
for high schoolers, which was national. And so at the center, which is a cooperative science center that NOAA funds, we would have community science fests, we would participate in STEM fairs in doing atmospheric science um, uh, experiments to maintain and contribute to the pipeline. But as far as mentoring goes, so we had an educational lead and for the mentors at the source program we have, it's volunteer. So that's a, but having descriptions of the types of mentoring that the students need is also helpful so that people know what they're volunteering from. We also have mentor training. And um, I, I met with all of the mentors for all of the students prior to their arrival to talk about the mentoring, the different aspects of mentoring, and you know to offer support in any way that we can. So if you're incoming, which, which is first year for us, you get a coach who's not related to the research that you're doing at all. They're more checking in on you, checking in on how you are here in Boulder and you know, offering you an outlet, so to speak. The writing mentor is focusing on the, um, the deliverables that we have for the poster, the abstract, et cetera. The research mentor guides the research and we try to have work plans with benchmarks to track progress because 11 weeks really is not that much for research, but the fact is they're learning methodology in their different areas. And so I think that those are certain ways to try to understand the model. So it's, it's but it's mutually beneficial. So it's not just mentors giving of their time, effort, and energy. It's also them learning from the students. So that's an important point to remember that the arrows go both ways. I have a quick follow-up on that, which is, do we feel like we, right? So I, I like this idea of sort of, you know, um, you know, pairing undergraduates or graduate students with, you know, for instance, rec students. Um, are there a set of best practices or are there a set of resources that we as advisors can help our, you know, our graduate students to be better mentors? I mean, I think that I potentially see that as, as a gap, right? In that, um, you know, often that, that onus falls on them to say, okay, well, you, you know, we want you to sort of be working along, but um, with this, um, you know, with this undergraduate student, but, you know, are we doing a good enough job of preparing the graduate students to be mentors and, and if not, then how, you know, how can we be, be better at that? That's a good question. There's, um, and it really comes by with personalities. So there are some people that naturally and are very driven to mentoring and can put themselves in the shoes. So I think knowing the student that you're matching with the uh, incoming student is a really good idea. And I do think, um, you know, you went from the, um, from these more advanced researcher mentors that Soros has to the graduate student mentors. And we've actually seen that in Rex, the near peer mentorship is really helpful because it's so much easier to ask somebody who's closer in age, say, hey, I really don't understand this. Or what does that acronym that everyone uses in this group here mean? I, because they don't wanna ask their mentor because they don't wanna be stupid. And so I think having like this, this near peer mentor is very helpful and, but then, um, supporting like seeing if this grad student really connects with it and we can help with uh, and programs like us can help with there's a lot of mentor tips we have there's mentor training so if you are in the boulder area you can connect with our programs if you are outside of the boulder area there's also a lot of resources we could share with any of your students that may be um, matched up and then we can help with the mentor training that's great and i was just going to add as well oh. Uh, I was gonna add as well, the REU Geo um, Resource Center is hosted by, <laughs> I'm just giving your information, Kadidia, um, <laughs> hosted by UCAR. So that's a really great online resource where you can get a lot of information, best practices about mentoring. Um, and I think it's a great idea for, met, for graduate advisors to train graduate students to be effective mentors. And to remember that as a mentor, 
you don't have to be everything, which is the beauty of the multiple mentoring or a constellation of mentors model, um, because that's a lot of work for one person to do. Was there a question or? All right. Um, so I, I see a lot of focus here on like early stages. Venkat sort of described a pipeline problem. The trouble is that as a community, especially as senior members of a community, to focus um, disproportionately on the pipeline is an abdication of responsibility for systemic biases within one's own community, within all the other levels. And so my question, I guess, is what are the effective ways that we can um, promote diversity, say, from early career levels through senior levels? I do not know if I can answer your question directly, but in the Columbia area, there used to be a summer workshop for high school science teachers for geology. You know, again, they don't teach geology in schools, but just to, so I think what uh, uh, organization like systems can do, and again, with funding from one of these sources, is to try to reach out to high school or middle school science teachers, because instead of going to one student at a time, which is very difficult, uh, you train the trainers and then see how that will play out in the future. It, I, I think this is the point of what I'm trying to ask, which is uh, like within our professional community, um, it, so everybody should read this article. It's in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution, written by uh, Katie Grogan. The title is How the Entire Scientific Community Can Confront Gender Bias in the Workplace. The data there is about gender bias, but it, there's a nice diagram there about the leaky pipeline and how the systemic biases at every stage, you know, through graduate school, PhD, early career, senior levels, all of those stages, the systemic biases are working against diversity. And that's something that as a community we need to address. And focusing on the K-12 level and how to promote things there, it is one ingredient, but it is not where we need to spend all the time. And um, to address that question, I, at series we have um, a, a diversity and inclusion um, director who does a lot of thinking about that question. Um, especially focus not just at the early career, but also on the hiring process. And it really comes to the hiring process in, in many instances. And that starts obviously at the advertisement process. I mean, if you look around the room here, um, you'll see already, and that's why the panel is here, but that there's not a lot of representation also um, across. So bringing, have, making sure you have on the hiring committee, you have females, you maybe have underrepresented people that can bring different perspective and really make sure that your pool that you're drawing from, that you have applications and you encourage one-on-one, -on -one, like Leho said earlier, that you say, we have this position open and we want you to apply because you, we think you are a qualified person in the first place. And then awesome, you're also di diverse, you know, um, you're not a token person, you're an awesome researcher and that way, that's why you should apply. How many of you, just a real quick poll of the audience, um, how many of you, particularly those that have served on um, uh, hiring committees in maybe the past couple of years were required to attend an implicit bias training workshop before sitting on that commi committee? Okay, so those of you that are on hire, right, so this is one mechanism at least that, you know, if, if your university or, or institution does not have that requirement, I think that that's a good place to start, right? To, to approach HR, approach the, the Title IX office and say, hey, this is a problem. You know, we, we folks need implicit bias training before they sit on these committees. And, um, and it needs to be, right, uh, those, those skills and understanding and identifying um, and reducing those implicit biases are, are perishable. And therefore, this is why people need to sit on you know, go through that training every time before you go to, you know, before you sit on a hiring committee. So these are, that's one step I've seen sort of in my experience that can help, at least with the hiring. Uh, so I think the point about training graduate students to mentor is a really good one, but I would also say that we need to train faculty to mentor. Um, and I guess I kind of have multiple ideas that I want to put out and see how people can react to. Um, so 
one thing I think I've found is that things that I am not aware of are very important to some of my students. So for example, one of my students said that um, one of our seminar, seminar speakers came in and he was a white male, but he had his pronouns on his title slide and how important that was for her to be able to see that. Um, and these are things that I, um, I need to learn these things. I, I don't necessarily know these things. And I, as a department that I am in, we are not doing the job that we need to do. And I feel like there are signals and things that we could do to put out to say, you know, I use she, her, and that's going to talk to some people and let them know that we are open. So, but beyond that, we need also all of the faculty to be on board because we need to sh not just say we have this environment that is going to be helpful or, you know, support and mentor in many ways, people from all backgrounds, but we also have to have an environment that is supportive for people of all backgrounds. So I feel like we need training, not just for our faculty as to how to mentor and work with diverse people, but how we can also signify to others that we are open to uh, people. Because I feel like in the earth sciences, we have a diversity problem on many levels. It's socioeconomic, it's people of color, it's people of dis with disabilities. Um, and so are there resources, are there trainings, are there things that we can do to kind of improve? I mean, I feel like at the faculty level, we need to improve if we're gonna be really able to embrace different people, you know. Another real quick question um, of, of maybe new hires and or early career faculty, how many are required to have a diversity, equity, inclusion like statement as part of either the application package or their annual evaluation? All right, well, um, yeah. All right, thank you so much for this panel. Uh, I just had a question um, regarding the kind of the, a lot of these programs, particularly the REUs and even things like graduate fellowships that a lot of institutions have. And I know there's a lot of diversity across different institutions in terms of like what criteria are they use, what the focus of those programs are. But what can institutions and agencies like the NSF do to encourage and make sure that a lot of these programs like REUs that are ostensibly designed to help promote and increase the type of candidates, the type of diversity that we bring into our field, not simply become just another kind of check mark or stamp on someone who's already gonna be successful anyway. So I've seen with students that I've mentored at the undergrad level, they've applied to REUs only to be told that essentially they weren't competitive unless they already had a publication. And when you're a, sophomore undergrad that is just completely insane and so i know there's a huge diversity of the type of programs and what their focuses are but i also have a feeling and i've seen with things like nsf grfp and other things that they more often than not kind of end up being defined by merit in some sense but the but our criteria for merit are very kind of tailored to people who are already in a very strong position to succeed and so they end up not really playing a big role in kind of broadening type of people that we're bringing into our field. So what can we kind of do to address that? So in the RU community, I know that um, we have an annual PI meeting and at the PI meeting, there's a lot of conversation about how do you write application forms? And there has been uh, the last meeting in last summer was really focused on how do you make it inclusive? How do you how do you bring um, more people? And so don't ask, what are your research experiences? But what experiences do you bring that are, why this benefit? So there's like slight differences in how you ask these questions that are more inclusive. So somebody who hasn't had a lot of um, opportunities to do internships unpaid and this and that can still talk about something meaningful in the application. And so there is com conversations in the RU programs about that. Um, but I don't know, that doesn't quite answer the question of what the center could do. So we, we've talked a lot here about positive things that we can do, mentorships, REUs, um, programs like SOARS and Recess. But if you look at the numbers, it's hard to see how that's, that's where the problem is. 
for example, I'd guess that there are something like 40 or 50 students in recess and SOARS every year. And that's more than the total number of underrepresented minorities who get geoscience PhDs every year. Even these students with all of the positive mentorship that we can possibly give them through great programs like that are not all getting all the way through. So what I'm wondering is, where are, we, where are the negatives coming in? Can we focus on those and getting them out of the way? More specific question. So usually the most I can do for diversity is to leave the room, right? But, <laughs> <laughs> but this summer, I'm really lucky. We, we, in Woods Hole, we've got this uh, uh, partnership in education program. And uh, I've got a black student from University of South Carolina who's coming up. And specifically, how can I keep him from sporting out of the pipeline? <laughs> what can I do to be a good mentor for him? Hi. I don't know. It depends on what the student wants to do. I mean, they're all not going into academia. The SOARS program was designed to be a graduate bridge program. So not everyone decides to go that way and that's their right and there's pathways into the career as well. But I mean, if they've shown the aptitude and the um, capacity, then of course opportunities are important. I think that understanding the wealth of opportunities is, is the most important thing. So, you know, private sector, government, and then of course academia, because that's where I think like this lady was saying, the faculty have the real benefit and opportunity to show the opportunities within that field. It's really the faculty that excite the student. Great. Maybe one last question and then we'll have to wrap up so that Greg can close the meeting. So um, Effie, yeah, I catch the best is that's maybe the more important thing. Effie, do you? Just to see in the application of the future faculty members that they listed there, first line, like, you know, birth date, here is not allowed, but birth date. The, the other, married, number of children, um, two years maternity leave or paternity leave, and then publications and even comments such as my publication record is very strong uh, um, despite my maternity leave. And the committee was looking very positively in that. He said, look, you know, the maternity leave or paternity leave is um, kind of not even for asking. It is um, given to them. It's not a question, I don't want it or whatever. They pay you and all of this. So this is a much more open culture, especially in Sweden that I've served in many committees, uh, where, for example, this is not something to hide uh, for a woman or for a, father that has little kids, et cetera. And um, it does not act negatively in any way. In fact, I've seen it so positively. The other thing, I was in a, um, the, uh, the Stockholm Water Prize nominating committee. No uh, public statement would made or no TV channel would come if it was not 50-50 representation in the panel. Meaning absolutely no. <laughs> so there were some rules except especially in Sweden that were imposed from above and the culture has changed in a way that's a little more, um, you know, natural to have a career, have your children, declare it in your resume, be part of the back. If you did some work even during the year that you were on maternity leave, that's a plus. Um, so anyway, I, I just wanted to say that we are cultures behind some other countries. Can I just say one sentence that maybe ties this and the other comment together? I think the way you, what you can do to answer that question as a, every individual in this room is if you care about these people that are with you that are maybe pregnant in, while they're in your group, and then you can really provide opportunities. If you provide mentorship and have a student, even if they are not in touch, but then you just send them an email and say, I really care, still care about you, that means a lot and it's gonna keep people in the field if they know there's a community that cares about me and I don't have to fight to be in there and that could be on all levels and it could be pretty small. I think that's something any of us could do. 
Great. Well, I think we'll have to wrap it up there. Um, but perhaps on a positive note, which is that um, although this is going to require cultural change, cultural change is something that you know we ourselves as individuals can sort of instigate. So um, let's thank our panelists um, here and uh, for their time and perspective. And I'll pass this over to Greg to close this out. So it, it feels awful to cut that conversation what feels like short. I think this has been really great. And, and, uh, and thanks, the, thanks again to the panelists for, uh, for joining us for that. So I don't have much to say other than first a note of thanks um, for everyone who made the meeting possible so that you know who you are, speakers, poster presenters, clinic leaders, workshop leaders on Monday. Um, you're all listed here, the roasters from last night uh, and the roasties, uh, breakout leaders and scribes and uh, the integration facility staff who have uh, worked really hard to, to put on these last three days. So one last note, uh, next May 2020, we've reserved this space for Systems 2020. We already have a theme. The theme will be ecosphere and geosphere. As you know, our themes are not exclusive of all the great science that you do, but that'll be a unifying theme about living things and the inorganic earth and how those things function together. So thank you all and see you next year. <laughs>